Hey everyone, welcome back to the Flow Track Podcast, flowtrackpodcast at gmail.com. I'm Kevin Sully, joined by Gordon Mack. And if you're watching on video, Gordon's never ready for the intros of these shows. He's either like fixing his hat, he's slightly out of the screen. Are, are you ready, Gordon? Are you ready to go now? I think I'm ready. I was eating a vanilla finger. Have you ever had vanilla fingers? They are quite scrumptious. I saw one at Target last night. And I bought it and it reminds me of childhood. So that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to feel like a child. So I bought these cream filled vanilla fingers. Wow. We won't disclose yeah. what time of day it is, but I, I think is. I already said good morning. <laughs> it's 9 a.m. <laughs> yes, I guess I didn't think about that, but I don't really think about time anymore. We're in quarantine. Every day, every hour, it's all the same. It's just one giant block of blah. So. No matter what I eat or drink, it's okay. Yeah. I've been getting, I've been getting called out for my food and beverage choices at different hours by my significant other. Uh, but I just don't <laughs> I just brush it off and keep going. Keep grinding. Keep going. Yeah. I guess at the t at after twenty four hours, whatever you've eaten is whatever you've eaten for a day. And does it really matter what order in which you've consumed the food, really? Exactly, right? Like, we don't have a real day anymore because we don't have the, all right, like, middle, middle, beginning, middle, and end to a day any. There's no beginning, middle, end to the week. There's no beginning, middle, end to the to the month. There's no beginning, middle, end to the year, to our lives mm -hmm. now. So who cares if we're cracking open a, a, a Bud Light seltzer at, like, <laughs> 2 o'clock on a Tuesday? Like, it doesn't matter doesn't matter i'm well, not saying i did that but i did but you know it's fine <laughs> while vanilla fingers may remind you of your youth we got some news in the running world that might hearken people back to their days growing up uh, being running fans david monte broke the story that dathan ritzenhine has retired at the age of 37 he burst onto the scene in 1999 so depending how old you are a lot of people grew up with Ritz in their life, Gordon being a figure in American and international distance running, and he's decided to to call it a career now. Yeah, uh, very long career, you could say. He's thirty seven. Uh, he has he shares a birthday with multiple goats. Uh, he has hmm. probably the greatest birthday of all time. Check out this <laughs> incredible list of people he shares a birthday with. Tiger Woods, you can argue goat and goat in uh in golf. golf. LeBron James, <laughs> top five goat in basketball, shares birthday with Carson Wentz. We all know Carson Wentz is a great. He shares the, the birthday with Nick Simmons, who might be the eight hundred meter goat during his time and on the U.S. level at least. And he shares mm -hmm. a birthday with none other than yours truly, Gordon Mack. December thirtieth, great great day to be born. Ritz Woods. Wentz, James, and Mac. The content goat himself. Uh, I was, let's see, a year behind Dathan Ritzenhain in, in high school. So I was full into my running nerdery when he was rising to prominence in 1999. He won Foot Locker the first time. And then in the year 2000, he won the race against the big three defending his title, beat Webb and Hall there. And it was one of those events, Gordon, where at the time you're like, hey, is this just a big deal because I'm paying attention to it? Is this just a big deal because for me it's really relevant because they were seniors when I was a junior and I would always go and look up their results even though I was nowhere close to them. But I think it's one of those things that actually stood the test of time. When you look at those three guys' careers, that was a classic race. That's probably still, I think, the most famous uh, on the men's side footlocker race uh, of all time, maybe even the most famous just distance race, even if you want to throw in miles, two miles, three thousands, or what have you, those three coming together. And that's really where it, the whole thing started for Ritz. Cause if you were able to beat those two guys in high school, your potential was, was enormous at that point. Yeah. And it'll be, I think, uh, it would be interesting to kind of look back at his career from start, middle and end. Um, mm -hmm. on this pod, uh, I already brought up his mile split page and looked at some of his early marks that, you know, mm -hmm. at the time were like very impressive. And 
it, I mean, it's weird be like if he was obviously one of the best high school runners during his era, but a lot of times it doesn't get the same recognition that like a top high school athlete gets now in 2020, where there's a lot more internet, you know, there's Twitter, there's all these, you know, when we were, when, well, when he was uh, in high school and yourself, like mm -hmm. the only coverage you got was you know the local paper about your county you know you rarely were getting this national exposure unless it was you know Foot Locker maybe get a little bit of national exposure but it's not the same as it was like right Arcadia like right now you, so, Arcadia yeah. but yeah. you know it's kind of I think one cool exercise would be to kind of recap Dathan's career from the sure. start the middle and end and start with his high school I'm not, I'm I'm not sure this is his first race ever because I think Miles Split's database just doesn't go back farther enough far enough. But according mm -hmm. to Miles Split, his first recorded mark on the internet was the state championship 3200, where he ran 931 and got sixth. Uh, this was May 30th of 1998. Um, so this is before his first Foot Locker appearance. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean. Your fir his first mark in high school is a 931, 3200. It's pretty good. I don't know. Yeah, I that mean, would have been... 98 would have been his freshman year, I believe, because he graduated in in 01. So that would have been his freshman year already making the state meet. Yeah, those those PRs are... I mean, his PRs are high school, 405, 841, and then 1344 in the 5,000. So the internet was beginning... This is going to make me sound really old. The internet was beginning to become a thing then. And looking up results was beginning to become a thing then. And I remember going to the, wait for this one, kids, the computer lab before cross-country practice or track practice and refreshing running websites back then to see the top lists. And anytime you saw Ritz's name on there, it was a big deal. And anybody who was close to Ritz, like, oh, they must be, they must be pretty good. So, yeah, we couldn't stream the race. We really didn't know what he looked like other than, you know, there, there, were, there were pictures of him, obviously. This wasn't the 1920s. But, like, you didn't know what he looked like when he was running, really. You had all these still photographs. You'd watch Foot Locker. It would go on tape delay back then. So you'd have, to, you'd have to wait a week or two. And some people waited the week and didn't look up the results. And some people looked them up right away. But then you watch the race on tape delay. And then you got to see these three guys who you'd been reading about all the time in the same place at the same time racing. I had seen, I was from the West Coast, uh, went to high school in Las Vegas. So I went to Foot Locker West uh, the year uh, where Ryan Hall was running. So I, it might have been that exact same year. So I had, I had seen him in real life. I had watched him run at least once. So I had some idea of it, but the, the three of them together was special. And I just remember when Ryan Hall was getting ready to race, when he, was, when he showed up at Mount Sac, People were asking him for autographs, and it just completely blew my mind when he was in high school. Other runners were asking Ryan Hall for autographs, and that was just the craziest thing to me because running at our high school was not a big deal. So to go to this place where this guy was not only a huge star and there were all these people out going volunteering to spend their Saturday watching this race, but they were literally asking him for autographs. And the Ritz was – yes, he was built more for cross country. Hall was better on the shorter stuff. So it wasn't a surprise that Ritz – uh, beat Hall or Webb, um, which is funny because you think of Hall now as a m marathoner, but at that time he was really like, um, really dr drilling down on on the shorter stuff. But to beat Webb and and Hall as convincingly as he did, like I said, just really set him up as like, okay, this guy's going to be a star. It's just a matter of how far he can go um, once he leaves high school. Yeah, I mean, he went undefeated in high school after the the mile race at state in 1999. He went undefeated, mm -hmm. so uh, he he basically did not lose a single high school race in 2000 or in 2001. So that's pretty good. Yeah, I mean, that's uh, very hard to do. I mean, it's kind of it's kind of cool looking at like what he did so early, and like he in high school he was 11th at the USA's. Like that's yeah. that's crazy. Like in high school, imagine a high school senior getting eleventh in a five k, running thirteen forty four. That's so impressive. Well, and what was crazy too? That was the fall of a senior year. Then the spring of a senior year, of course, Webb goes to pre, steals the show completely, 
ends up on Letterman, right? So then you have these two two guys, not even if you're not even including Ryan Hall, you have these two absolutely mega talents focusing on different events coming out of high school at the same time. And let me set the stage for you, Gordon, and some of our younger listeners. Um, in 1996, at the 1996 Olympics, guess how many American men finished in the top eight in the distance events? And I'm counting everything from 800 through the marathon. How many American men in the 1996 Olympics how many top eight finishes did they get? I'm using eight because the 800 only had eight person final. Otherwise, yeah, I yeah, yeah. it to ten. So, I'm well. I'm, here, here's here's a crazy thought. From like, I think it's been zero to three for '96, 2000, 2004, and like from '96 to 2004 was a very weak year, weak times for distance U.S. male distance running being top eight. So I'm gonna say zero to three. So I'll say one. You would be, yeah. So it was two in ninety six. Two, okay. Two thousand, two thousand. You got it absolutely right. It was zero. Two thousand one World Championships, zero. Two thousand three World Championships, zero again. Zero. And just as a baseline, just as a baseline, twenty sixteen Olympics, twenty sixteen Olympics, the most recent Olympics that we had. How many top eight finishes did the U.S. have in the distance events? Just guess. Just throw a number out there. Or we say men or and women? Just men, just men. I'm just keeping this just to the men. men because I'm talking specifically about the big I mean, three's one, impact here. Let me try to do the math in my head. One, three, <laughs> three, four, five, six, eight, twelve. 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 Oh, okay. Twelve. And okay, if you th if you think that's an outlier, you know, 2019. This past World Championships, there were there were seven finishes in in the top eight. So, I bring that up to say, they were Webb, Ritz, Hall. They were entering an era when the idea of an American making the final was a pretty big story in the distance side of things, and in a, the idea of an American meddling in an event or contending for a major marathon victory was out there. It was a bit out there and then you have these two guys come up now webb of course goes to michigan hall goes to stanford and ritz the guy we're focusing on for this episode goes to colorado chooses the the colorado buffaloes there to join a a powerhouse team they had jorge torres they had eduardo torres good squad there oh yeah phenomenal squad and Again, he's com he's coming to Colorado as a thirteen forty four five k PR mm -hmm. freshman, like yep. that. That's you know, like if, if you you, it's like it's like getting like a Nico Young type because I think Nico Young is like a sub fourteen type guy. I mean, he ran sub eight in the three k, so I think he could break fourteen. But mm -hmm. Colorado was getting a hammer in in Ritzenhine. I mean, the guy. Coming in out of high school, 1344 5K PR. He was an 843, 3200, 408 mile or 1600. Um, it was, he, he was good. <laughs> and uh, right off the back, there, there's no, there's no red, uh, red shirting wasn't really a thing, I guess, is that much early on. And his freshman yeah. year, he comes out and gets second uh, in the Rocky Mountain Shootout, which is, uh, he he has he has like one of the top course records on that home course. Colorado is really notorious for having this really big like time trial type home cross country event that they do in early mm -hmm. October every year. I think it's been canceled since, but he he was basically having like a Ben Sorrell type season uh, for the Colorado wise because Ben Sorrell became a top ten guy. It's true freshman year, I believe, but he got mm -hmm. second in his opener. Um, I think he was top five in the next Invitational. He was second at Big 12s, second at the Mountain Regional, and then he got fourth at the Cross Country Championships his freshman year. Mm -hmm. Fourth as a freshman, that is impressive. And I'm trying to bring up who he lost to that 2001 season. So, yeah, it was Eastern Michigan guy, Boaz Chabowat, whoa, yeah, and then his teammate Jorge Torres, Alistair Craig, and then Dathan Ritzenheim. Yeah. 
man. And this is where, yeah, at Colorado is where we saw the injury bug hit, which was a theme throughout his career, right? They like it was it was difficult for him to stay healthy for long periods of time. But oh three, I don't know if you jump want to jump ahead already to his cross country title, but he wins in oh three. Um, and that race obviously is difficult to win. <laughs> there's, there's, uh, 250 plus people, um, who are very qualified on the starting line next to you. So to pull it off is, is incredible. So he may, he wins it. I don't think he ever won a, did he, did he ever win a track title in the NCAA? Um, I do not believe he did. Cause his senior year, I think he got second to Robert Cesaret of Arizona in the 5,000. So I'm running through his, he, his last year where he's competing. Yeah. So these are these are his NCAA championship performances. Obviously, he was he won a bunch of Big 12 titles, but he was fourth in cross freshman year. Then he mm -hmm. ran got third in the indoor 5K. Then he was fourth in the outdoor 5K. Um he had run 1327 as a freshman um outdoors at the Cardinal yeah. Invitational. 1327 as a true freshman is a really good 5K time. So he had two top four. He had three top four performances in his first three championship uh, runs. Then he got hit with the injury bug, and then he came back and won cross in '03. Um, he was fourth indoors in a in a 5K again. I'm trying to. I'm, I'm going through. He's second in the 5K in 20, 2004, and then that was it. Then so he, he ended his it, yeah. collegiate, He ended with a second place finish in 2004. Yeah, and he had eligibility left. He decides to go pro. So 04 was an interesting year, right? 04, that year, he runs a crazy fast 10,000 at Stanford. And that 10,000 gives him a qualifying mark. And just as was the case uh, last championship, standards became an issue, Gordon. You'll never believe it in 04. So he's hurt <laughs> going into the he's hurt going into the Olympic trials. But there's only a few guys who have the standard. And some of them are going to run different events. Like Meb, he's going to run the marathon, even though he's in the 10,000. So Ritz essentially just needs to finish at the Olympic trials, and he'll make the team. And that's exactly what he did. I think he got 22nd at those Olympic trials. He finished in the 20s, but he made the Olympic team because he was one of the three guys who had the standard. He goes pro at that point officially and chooses Brad Hudson as his coach. So he makes the Olympic team. So 04, right? This would or this would be his um, if he graduated high school in 01. 02 would be his freshman year. So this would be his, essentially his, after his junior year, right? His true junior year, he's already on an Olympic team. Doesn't go the way he wants. Gets hurt, as I mentioned, and, and in Athens he DNFs. So he doesn't actually finish the race, but he's on an Olympic team. At the age of about 21. It's pretty good. Yeah. It's also wild the way it worked, too. I mean, imagine if we, the whole track community was up in arms about when they made the standards, you know, even harder for the 2020 uh, trials or like yeah. the Olympic standard. And people were like, we want the top three. The top three is sacred. The top three is sacred. Is the top three sacred when we're sending <laughs> a 21-year-old who finished in 20th? No. Like, yeah. this whole idea that the top three is sacred is a really a new concept. Uh, it hasn't always been like that. And we kind of have short memories to re – I mean, we were <laughs> – think about it. Like a side rant. There was, like, this whole idea of top three is sacred, top three is sacred. We literally sent – an athlete who didn't make the women's 800 final to uh, Doha. So, like, this idea that the top three is sacred is yeah. cool. Anyway, because we so, haven't been doing it from from day one. We haven't been doing it back since 2004 when uh, when Ritz gets to go. And look, it helped Ritz out. Yeah. Well, I remember, I remember watching this race, and they would cut away. They'd be on the main pack of leaders, and then they would do these occasional cutaways back to Ritz because they knew, okay – here are the guys with the standard. Nobody else is going to get the standard. Let's just let's just remind the viewers that this guy still gets to make it. And he was hurting. He was hurting. He was just basically trying to do whatever he could to get on the Olympic team because it was really important to him to make an Olympic team. Then he's pro. And here's another interesting point in his career. 
all of the big three are really interesting because they didn't – some of the guys today, they have just like – their careers are too perfect in a way. It's like – and then they won, and then they won more, and then they won more. And then they might have like a year where they're injured. But the big three all have these like crazy t- plot twists of like coaching changes and event changes. Because in 06, Gordon, in 06, he's 23 years old, and he's like, I'll do the marathon. And he, and he runs New York City and runs 214. And you're like, okay, wait a minute. This is a guy who – made the Olympic team in the 10,000. We already know like his 5,000 ability, as you mentioned it, and he's only 23 years old. And that's rare. Now, Hall went to the marathon early too. People in other countries go to the marathon early. But that for him to have that much success in those other events and still give it a shot at the marathon was very interesting. Yeah, I mean, has he ever gone on record I he decided to transition so quickly. I think he just wanted to give it a shot. He wanted range. I know. I mean, he said it was like indescribable pain that he felt because he went out. <laughs> he he did what everybody does in their first marathon, which is go go out too hard, and then from there it didn't go that well on the back <laughs> half. Uh, I'm sure there were some financial considerations involved because when he went back. Later to New York, I remember a bunch of years later, he called it like his re-debut because he wanted to just like scrap the first one from his uh, from his memory. But um, I mean, I'm trying to think of a comparison now to like what that would what that would look like for someone that good. I mean, I I, I guess the only comp would be like Rupp if Rupp when he was just a two years out of college went to the marathon after making teams in the 5k and the 10k yeah especially when you're at that time he was like a, he's a sub 13 30 5k guy and in that era that was like hey you're in the if you're breaking 13 30 you're one of the top people so you're you know you're like in the top eight class i believe during that time and era so you're like hey if i'm one of the fastest eight guys with in the 5k 10k i should stick around and see if i can you know constantly make teams at this level so uh yeah, it is. It is shocking to see someone who was showing that they had the talent to compete at the long distance on the track, but then they were like, "No, I want to. <laughs> I want to take it a few more miles more." Well, and so in '04, that last collegiate season, he ran twenty-seven thirty-eight. He set the collegiate record, and in Stanford that year, and that's that was his debut. That was his first time. So his PR, he was a mid twenty-seven caliber runner. I'm reading the, the paragraph from David Monty's story, which is on the site. It says, uh, uh, under Hudson's coaching, jumped right to the marathon in 2006, making his debut at the New York City Marathon. It was a controversial decision. And after a 105.35 first half, he finished 11th in 214.01, calling the discomfort he endured in the last four miles, quote, undescribable. <laughs> so <laughs> there he goes. But then, so he comes back. Remember the 08. Olympic trials were held in 07. I know it's confusing. People forget about yeah. that. Well, but... he first he came back and he he made the 10K world team in 2007. Yes. And then ended up, ended up finishing ninth, just outside that top eight, that top eight mark that we've been thinking. So he's yeah. coming off of a top, he was third in the, the outdoor 10K at trials. Then he finishes ninth at Os- in Osaka, same year where Kara Goucher was finished meddled right isn't that the Karagatsu year yeah yeah and i should say when i was bringing up all of the historical medal performances in the u.s the women i mean on the marathon there was some progress right uh dina castor meb meddled um but like the women really got it going with goucher flanagan in 07 08 and then roberry gets a medal in 09 and then the men the men started rolling on after that and now it's just like you said it's it's a uh it's a common event when americans medal but yeah and so he finishes ninth in that thing and like i said now we'd be like ninth well what's that's the ninth biggest story from from the u.s performance no it was like super rare to get in the top eight so ninth was ninth was solid then yeah and then he went to new york and yeah, got so, second at the trials yeah so, so then makes his trial. second yeah so he makes his second Olympic team there. So he's two for two on Olympic teams. Uh, and then 
in Beijing, ninth in the Olympic marathon, right? So he goes, you said ninth in ninth in 07 and then ninth in, in 08. And then we get to 09, which I think was the high point of his career. Okay. This is what Ritz did in 09. And this stands the test of time. Gets second in USA's in the 10,000. Goes on to the world championships and finishes sixth in a PR of 27-22. Beats Rupp in that world championship race. Later on that summer, runs a 12-56-5,000. Sets the American record. It's still the third. He's still third all time. The list is Legat, Selinski, and then Ritz. So all the people who didn't pay attention to the first part of Ritz's career and only know him as a marathoner, let me repeat the list to you in the 5,000 in the United States. Rupp, Selinski, Ritz. Then he goes to the world half and gets third. Runs 1-0-0-0-0 to get bronze in the world half. Who did he finish one spot ahead of? Future world record holder in the marathon, Wilson Kipsang. Closes out the year by getting 210 in London. Look at that range, Gordon. Yeah. 210 in London, 1256, and 60 flat. Yeah. I mean, who breaks the American record? Who runs breaks the American record in the 5K three years after making their marathon debut? <laughs> right. Right. The whole thing, the whole story, it, there's, there's not a straight line here. It's very complicated. Right? There was not some clear path. Now, we should say, earlier in that year, he switched coaches. He leaves Brad Hudson, joins the Oregon Project with Salazar. Now, I don't know I, I don't know at the time if people gave credit to Salazar for turning his career around and turning his fortunes around. It seemed like a very close um, – the, the time, uh, the amount of time was so close in proximity. You're like, okay, well, this is probably all the work with Hudson – had a lot to do with this too. There might've been some tweaks, but anyway, keep going. Yeah. Controversial tweaks. Some may say, <laughs> well, but, uh, well, well, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's like, he's, if you're running with one coach for 10 years and then you switch coaches for two months and then you run better, like distance running doesn't really work that way where you're like, all of a sudden you're, you're better just because it's not like he diagrammed a different play. It, it probably was, uh, a lot of it was just uh, he had a breakthrough that year um, and and was was running well. And this is a theme for Ritz. And I think it's just a theme for the entire big three. Once they got going, Gordon, they just stayed on a roll. And when they were in a rut, it took a lot to get them out of a rut, right? When things are going bad, when they got injured, it was hard to get on track. But when they were good, they were phenomenal. Because look at that string of races that year. Look at how good 09 was. Um, that holds up, right? Even today, that holds up. That that's not a good by 2009 standard. That's 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 if someone did that this year, we would be like, wow, they might be the best yeah. distance runner in the United States this year, or they might be the best <laughs> distance runner of the of this this little era. And to uh kind of piggyback on the whole theme of Rich's career of zigzagging up and down, back and forth, injury prone and highs and lows. When he runs at 12.56 in Zurich, do you think he knows, hey, you're not going to run a track race for two more years after this 12.56? <laughs> like he runs at 12.56 right? and he's not uh. going to step on a track for two more years, which is crazy. Yeah. If you if you're if you're fresh off a two twelve fifty six, you can tell you and someone's gonna say, Hey, you're done for two years. And like you'll be like, What? You're crazy. And that's exactly what happened. In 2010, he did not run any track races. He ran uh he ran he ran the marathon in New York, uh mm -hmm. ran a cross country race. Uh, but then 2011, he was hurt. He ran two random like local road five Ks, mm -hmm. you know, so in November. So it's just crazy that to go two full years without touching the track after, you know, you mean you run 1256 and the next time you're on the track running a 5k, he runs 13, 14. Yeah. Um, well, in May, this is one of the, this is one of the what ifs. And I want to get to that at the end. I want to get to some of the, the what ifs, um, later on. Uh, but you brought up one of the ones that was on my list. So yeah, only races twice in 2011. Then we go to 12 and 13. 
which are the last two great years, the last years he's on the track, right? Fourth in 2012 gets fourth in the Olympic trials marathon. Do you remember who bumped him off? Do not. Oh, I don't know. Maybe 2021 Olympi- Olympian. Oh, Abhi yeah. Abdurrahman. <laughs> Abhi. <laughs> who was a complete, who was a sleeper then? Who was a sleeper then? And then all these years later did it again. So, but he comes back to Eugene, doesn't have the standard. Again, history doesn't repeat, Gordon. It rhymes. Didn't have the standard. What does he do? He goes out and gets it in the Olympic trials to make it on that team. Goes on and gets 13th in the Olympics. Then goes to Chicago, runs the fastest marathon of his life, 207.47. I remember he was disappointed, though, afterwards because he didn't think he was competitive enough. He was he finished ninth that year with that 207.47. And then 2013, again, back on the track in the 10,000. Now um, he's running some 3Ks. He's running some track 3Ks. He's like, I'm dropping down in distance. <laughs> so this is the part of his career um, that kind of mirrored what we see from – like elite women in the United States, like a Flanagan or a huddle where it's like, they're good at everything and they're, they're bouncing between distances. But the primary focus, I, I guess at this point was, was the marathon, but you're right. He's running three Ks. He gets 10th at the world championships in the 10,000. So still a decent performance. And then fifth in Chicago, although he, he ran two Oh nine. So he ran a couple minutes slower, but finished higher than he did in in 2012 then 2014 he only races once 2015 he's not on the track at all he got seventh in boston 2016 he dnfs at the trials dnfs new york and 2017 he, and 2018 he starts to, nothing really then he starts trying he starts trying to, to become the molly huddle of the the roads where he he's trying to uh dip his feet in all the different national championships that we have on the roads i'm sorry it is yeah. crazy that there's like 14 road national championships <laughs> out there this is ridiculous it's like oh here's a 10 mile here's a 12 mile here's a 20k here's right. the 13.19k you know it's just crazy yeah but he's hey, become a road uh, warrior well right and at that point the the injuries are becoming a bigger and bigger issue right like he was scratching a lot of races we brought up the DNFs. 2019 in, in Boston gets 19th, runs 216, and then the last race starts the 2020 trials and doesn't finish. The end of his career, and obviously his career lasted longer than Alan Webb, but for a while there, though, his career was similar to Webb in that you had to respect him if he was in any race. And I even going up to the last couple of years, people were like, oh, okay, well. Ritz is in it. Can if he gets healthy, if he can just get to the start line, we know he's going to be able to to do something great because we've done it before. And how many times have we seen that in running, where it's just like once it's gone, it's hard. It's it's hard to recapture it. It's hard to live up to it. But it's also for us as fans, hard to forget how good they were. So we keep thinking, okay, maybe this will be the time. Maybe this will be the time. I mean, go back to those late Allen Webb years he would run like a, a 13.45K and people would be like, okay, he might be back. It's like, wait, hold on. He ran 13.40 in the 5K. Like, let's 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 pump the brakes a little bit here. Uh, we're years away from the 3.46. Uh, it's just, you know, age catches yeah. up. The amount of races catches up to you at, at a certain point. Well, just in general, the end of a lot of elite car- careers and even sub-elite type careers, it's always kind of weird. Right, I think the mm-hmm. retirement process for track and field athletes just isn't like just isn't isn't like clean. It's not like a clean cut mm-hmm. every time. There's always it's it's dragged on too long, and then you, there's also like the secret retirements where like they just stop running and you don't know. You're like, wait, that person, yeah. and then like three years later, after them not racing for three years, you're like, I'm retired, and I'm like, well. We, okay cool thanks for the instagram yeah. post but you know yeah obviously some athletes get a little bigger of a retirement because they had a bigger impact on the sport and their career was you know a higher degree of level Le- level of degree degree level level i don't know what i'm trying to say you know level, of level degree? Of is it level of degree or degree of the level no i don't think it's either but keep going i'm enjoying this okay <laughs> uh, so i mean i mean here, here like w- when do you think Ritz, his last chance of like 
looking back on it now, now knowing that he's retired, right? Yeah. He retires a few months after the trials. Obviously, I mean, the fact that there's no sport for another year might have made him want to do that even sooner than maybe he would have gone yeah. one extra year. We don't know. But when do you think was the retirement? Like, all right, I'm now just doing it because I'm sponsored. You know what I mean? Like, when did it, when did it become a job and not like a goal? Yeah, well, that's that's tough. That's tough. I, mean, I would say 2016 trials. You don't the year before he got seventh in Boston. So it's like, okay, of course you're gonna give it a shot at the trials, right? You get seventh in Boston, you can get top three. Don't you know? He can keep going from there. After that point, it just seemed like it was a lot of fits and starts of. Okay, he's getting momentum, and then he's stopping. But in general, okay, so he had, what, five Olympic cycles? 04, 08, 12, 16, and 20, right? I mean, that's a good, that's a full career. But I think 16, I think after 16, at that point, I thought, okay, well, he may be able to have a Abdi Abdurrahman like comeback, right? Or a Lagat. Meb level of longevity, or even someone like Shalane Flanagan or or Des Linden, but I he needs to show something first. It's not just going to pop up out of nowhere, right? You got to see, okay, man, he got he ran a really fast half, or he he was really close to to um, to to rup in this race. Something, some sort of signifier that he's there. Otherwise, you're just grasping onto what you saw before. So after 16, I began to look at that differently. Of like, okay. Until he's able to get to the starting line consistently and be healthy and put something out there, he he's not he's he's at the tail end of his career. Um, like I didn't think there were some people who were saying he was like a dark horse for 2020, and I just didn't I didn't see it. I mean, he was 30, 37 years old, right? And it's like we get and I don't. This is why I don't blame anybody uh, for for continuing their career as long as they want because obviously. Whatever, sir. If I could make money off of running, I would do it for forever. And if someone told me stop, I'd be like, "No, dude, what are you doing? I'm gonna, I'm gonna go get paid to run." But they also see the success stories, right? They see Meb, and they're thinking, "Oh, I could do that. What if I could have just one of those moments?" And that's completely in line with a competitive athlete's personality. You know what I mean? Like, of course they they. Of course, they're going to think that they can recapture it and get it back. And if they're seeing examples of it, even more so. So, but I, I think I think sixteen is where um, it really it really end, like turned at that point. Yeah, I guess it it's, all takes is one, right? It just takes one big moment. Yeah, exactly. To justify the four years of extension of a career. You know? Well, and look, anybody who's run competitively. We always compare ourselves to other people, even though we shouldn't. And we've all had that person a uh, uh, moment of like, oh, if, th if that person can do it, I can do it, right? So if you're seeing Lopez Lamong rip off crazy ten thousands, you know, ten years after he was winning fifteen hundreds, that's your motivation to to keep going. Um, but my goodness, he had a lot. I mean, Ritz had a lot of injuries, a lot of injuries, and I don't know how much of that was bad luck i don't know how much of that was from training and how he approached it but that was that was the the main issue i think that that did it but look you're looking at a guy who may like did all these things like it was a good it was a great career it was a great career oh yeah phenomenal career yeah. from start to finish like some people don't have like to, a combination of a great beginning middle and end like a great high school great college and great mm -hmm. post collegiate. I mean, some people only have a great high school career. Some people are only good in mm -hmm. college. Some people are only good as a pro. And he had to, he got to experience the highs of all three levels, which is a yeah. unique experience that most people don't get to do, you know? So, yeah. Well, so, I mean, and if you want to compare him, which is, is tough to, to the other big three, I mean, he made three Olympic teams, which that's, that's rare, right? And he had this longer career. He obviously outlasted the other two. Alan Webb's height might have been higher just in terms of, yeah, he ran through 46. The American record is 
still standing. He got to go on Letterman. Like he had, he had the celebrity, he had the fame. Um, but Ritz definitely had the longevity. I guess you could say a hall. I mean, being able to dominate an event in the U S for as long as hall did, um, and inch into you know, inch, you know, he was globally one of the guys who was up there in the U S Meb was there too, but that's pretty rare. And as we, as we've seen since it's really hard for an American to be relevant in the marathon. So I think they each did their part in a different way. And I think you could make an art. It's a good debate because you could make an argument for all three. It just depends on what you value in a career. Yeah. What do you, I mean, yeah. Do you value the highest high, the longest long, or the, <laughs> the I don't longest know long. I like that. The longest long, the highest high, or the consistent, consistent. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think, I think Ritz could make an argument for me just because of the, the consistency. Um, all these guys, though, it they they had really frustrating moments of their career, and they were public about their frustration, right? And I wonder if the current era is going to be the same way because the current era, it doesn't like there's, there's fewer and fewer what ifs about the current era because more, if they're not, if they're not cutting it, there's more depth and they'll just be replaced by somebody else. Right. But during this era, we only had a few people. So if they didn't pan out the bit, Oh, what happened to this person? What happened to this person? Currently, we don't really have the time or space to do that because, okay, okay, you're going to talk about what happened to German Fernandez. We could just talk about why would you not rather just talk about Centro winning gold, right? Like, yeah, it's like oh, there's a gold medal. Like, you you don't need to you don't need to fill in any blank spaces because right now U.S. distance running on the men's and women's side is so good. You just talk about the next person who came up and did it. Yeah, that that there's no that's like that's how. I, it's not like it's these three or bust. It's no, it's, it's one of these 12 or bust. Yeah. You know, like, yeah. So we're good. Like we can, we have, we have 12 to pick from not three. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So I, mean, I want to talk about now that we've run through the whole, the whole career, a couple of questions for you. What would, what do you think his high point was? What was Ritz's high point of his career? I, I think the high point has to be the 2012 outdoor Olympic trials. The fact that coming back, there's when you when you get fourth in an Olympic trials, it's like the worst position to get, right? And he had to sit on that fourth place finish for multiple months, and he he just put so much pressure on himself. Didn't have the standard. He knew this is his shot. It turned out to be his only shot, last shot at an Olympic uh, team. And I feel like the combination of the fourth place disappointment with the long wait to build up to this race. So there's just so much pressure. And then you get third and you hit the time. Like the fact that he ac accomplished that trials finish with all the added pressure and story behind it made mm -hmm. it more impressive. If he would have not run the Olymp, if he would have not run the, the marathon trials and just showed up at, to do the 10 K and get third, it would not be the same, but he put all this pressure, self-imposed pressure because of the failure in the marathon then to come back and win the tank. I think that was my most memorable Ritz moment was the story, like that six month long story from despair to joy. So he literally does mm -hmm. the exact same reaction. You have like your hands in his face, right? And it's... <laughs> Two different versions of it. It's like the version of like disappointment, and then the version of re you know relief that you like mm -hmm. overcame that disappointment. So I'll go with 09 as the high point the entire year, just because it showed all that Ritz was capable of. It was a microcosm of his entire career. There's the incredible range and versatility. Second to Rupp at USA's in the ten thousand, but goes on to finish ahead of him. In Berlin, finishing sixth, runs that PR in the 10,000, then runs the 1256 American record. Again, he's still the number three performer all time in that event. Then third in the world half, 60 flat, finishes ahead of Wilson Kipsang to get the bronze, and then closes it out with a 210 marathon in London. 
So relevant in 5K all the way to the marathon in one year with some good major championship finishes in there as well. What about low point? Low point. Low point. Low point. I mean, there's the controversial low point of being tied to the whole Salazar and Mm -hmm. that investigation and just being involved in that conversation. You could say that's a low point that he couldn't be a bystander to it. He had to be part of it and had to answer that. So that's a, you know, that's a thing that's always going to have on his legacy is like, well, you know, certain people will look at it from different perspectives. There's going to be the harsh binary viewpoint where it's either one or a zero and you're either Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. a one or a zero. And then there's, you know, the spectrum viewpoint of like, okay, well, you know, you, not everything is black and white. Right. But yeah, I would say that is his low point, but on the track low point, um, I mean, I would say just the last four years, right? I don't know. Like after 2016, it's just, I mean, yeah, it's just like the low point of like. All the injuries. just having Yeah, and you're getting older and every six months there's a new article written about is this the time where Rittenheim returns? You know, like there's always like that like artificially inflated like watch out for Ritz and they're like oh we're going mm-hmm. through this again and then he feels like he's disappointing people when really you're just you're 34 and 36 and you're just you're injury prone like it's okay yeah you know, it's okay you, you don't need to keep doing it you know well at that point too he'd been running I mean he won his first Foot Locker in 1999 and you talked about making the state meet as a freshman running in the mid nines for 3200 so by the time you get to 2016, he's been running at a very high level for almost 20 years at that point. But 16, I think he thought he had a shot, and I think we thought he had a shot, just the the viewing public. And then you look at, okay, Meb and Rupp get on the team. Jared Ward gets in there for third. At that point, I still think he thought he had a shot. It was very hot that day, probably not the best conditions for him but i i think i would agree with you oh four was tough too not having to finish not being able to finish at athens but hey if you're 21 and in the olympics i'm not going to feel too bad for you and obviously he got to make two more teams and experience uh better moments there okay biggest what if biggest what if i have a few here that i'm thinking about what is what's your biggest what if uh biggest what if Do you want me to go first? You I go got first. three. Yeah, 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 yeah. I got three. Right, yeah. and you oh, can tell yeah, me. Three. Okay. So one of them is what if he didn't get to the what if he didn't go to the marathon so early, which was sort of what you discussed um before, which you could also tie into, you know, if he just focused on one event. You mentioned that he sets the American record and then in the five thousand, then doesn't run a track race for a couple of years. So that could be one. Another one I had. Uh, what if the half marathon was a bigger deal? I think that was his sweet spot distance. I think much like Molly Huddle, that's where he would have had his most success internationally. And what if the running world saw the world half marathon championships in the same way they saw a major marathon? Um, or what if there was a half marathon at the Olympics? I think that was a perfect distance suited to his skill set. In David Monty's article, he talked about why he liked the five and 10 and just being able to grind out front. Once he went to the marathon, it felt like, okay, I'm going to the marathon because that's the only place I have left to go as opposed to it being my, my specialty and it really playing to my strengths. So that's another one. And I could be wrong on that one, but my third one, Oh, this is what I wonder about all the people from this era. What if they came after other medalists, right? What if Ritz and Hein came after Rupp, came after Centrowitz, came after Flanagan, Goucher, like all these people came first. I just, I always got the feeling that people from this era were trying too hard. They were putting too much pressure on themselves because they thought they needed to have an out-of-body experience in order to medal. And if they saw people who went to college where they went to college, who trained where they trained, who had similar upbringings than they did, 
meddling at the global stage, they would have the proper perspective and, and maybe their career would have been uh, ultimately better, but at the very least more enjoyable. Maybe they would have enjoyed that they're running more. And that's something I've always wondered about. I don't know if it's accurate, but what if the, what if the eras were reversed here and Ritz and Webb and Hall weren't the ones really pushing on the door for them on the men's side of things, but they were the ones who were coming when the door was slightly ajar. It was good at what ifs. I like the what if of the half marathon. <laughs> it made me, it made me think about that. We need Lincoln to make the half marathon ultimate rankings. That's what we need. We need Lincoln. Lincoln, get on it. Stop your <laughs> run on right those now, half- Lincoln. We know you're listening to us when you run. Stop right now. Go home. Well, start typing. There's no way he's listening to us right now. Well, how many minutes are we on this pod? We're like what fifty minutes in. He's not running fifty minutes in his run. He he <laughs> he has already turned off the bot the iPod by now. You know he's pretending so, to do core. I mean I don't. I only listen to the first 20 minutes of every podcast because I'm done running after that. So, Oh, man. We better be more focused then at the top. Yeah. Get all your, your shit talking done in the first half of the pod. Um, uh, well, even internationally, I'll, I'll, like someone like Tedese, right? Zerzane Tedese, who was awesome at the half marathon and then can't get the marathon right at all. Like he would be seen completely differently. He'd be seen as one of the greats of all time if the half marathon was a bigger deal. It does seem kind of, I mean, it goes back on my, why is the marathon 26 miles anyway? Like, Mm -hmm. why do we have, why is, we only care about a six mile race and then a 26 mile race? Yeah. And everything in between. between. I mean, we pretend to care about it by creating these half world, half marathon championships. In the end, no one really cares about the 10K either. I feel like it's really 5K and marathon, you know, and I think it's mile 5K marathon. Those are the actual three events that people care about most. When it comes to distance running, you know, we keep on creating these extra like, oh, this, you know, but well, they because a 5,000 meter runner like, is just, yeah, but like a, if you, anytime an athlete can double, it makes me think that that event is repetitive. Like, I feel like the one and the two is repetitive because if the same person can dominate it, that means one is having, you know, one race. Yeah, I get so like, why do we need to have, yeah, so that's all I'm saying. Right, and I feel like five Ritz. and 10 are repetitive and one and two. Are, okay. Anyway, back to Ritz. Uh, I would say my, what if might be like the coaching order? Mm. Like what if he went to Salazar right away out of college? What if he stayed at Colorado an extra year and doesn't, you know, have that pro first pro year. Does that kind of change something, you know, cause he had a lot. I mean, you could he 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 had a lot still to show at the NCA level. I mean, looking, he didn't win a single NCA outdoor title or indoor title. He had the cross title, but like, what if he you know got back on the track one more time in the college world and like kind of worked on some more racing and won yeah. an outdoor title or two? You know, maybe it would be different, but yeah. So work on the closing speed. You're saying like get yeah. that closing speed part down that some of the other people who came after him did. Can you do me a favor? Do you have his Tila page open still? I do. Tila Can you go library. to 04? Can you go to 04 for me and find out the date that he ran that fast 10,000 at Stanford? I don't know if it was the Stanford invite or Peyton Jordan. I'm not April sure. April 30th. Which one. April. Okay. April 30th. Okay, stay on that page. Did he run a race on April 29th? Did he run a race uh, the day before ran, that? No, he ran on April 17th. What did he run on April 17th? A 1500 at Mount Sac. Okay. When was the big So when was the Big 12 meet that? Why would year? he run in Oh, Big 12 is May 1st. Oh, so he ran the next day. There we go. There we go. Yeah, that's what I was looking for. I read this somewhere when I was doing research. Yeah, yeah. he ran. He ran the next a collegiate day. record in the ten thousand at Stanford, and then the he next flew day to Norman. Or- <laughs> he flew to Norman, Oklahoma. Yeah, to run to win the Big Twelve five K in fourteen oh eight. That's wild. Do you think that we see happened, that tonight? Uh, we kind of had a similar thing with it, not back to back days like that, but. Oklahoma State, uh, Dave Smith purposely flew uh, Shadrach Kipchurcher to run at Peyton right the week mm-hmm. before conferences 
they he was the only athlete going there and the only purpose of running that was to get a time to be qualified for the wcap program because he didn't have a good yeah. enough time then uh but he it, it was messing up with like the the race schedule for him he's like no like he like sacrificed being you know peaking for big 12s by doing this one-off 10k at peyton a week between the two races so that's a lot that's not the same as back-to-back -back days <laughs> but uh yeah wow i didn't that even race that. Yeah. that race was pro that was probably late at night i'm guessing at stanford because every 10,000 is late at night at stanford so you get in a flight from the bay area at night or are you flying the morning of the race to norman oklahoma to run a five that i i wanted i think this would be i want the first i want my first question if we get to talk to ritz that's my first question tell me about april 30th and may 1st 2004 i bet i don't think that there's i mean those races go off at like 10 or 11 o'clock at night i doubt it that he flew out there there, there, there would have been no red eyes available so he probably had a 6 a.m flight he probably had a 6 a.m flight and then he probably landed in norman because norman like is there a there's not there's no direct flight from from san francisco to norman right no no it's definitely no. not so he probably no. well he also probably maybe they maybe he slept in like a hotel by the airport so he didn't have to wake up as early i don't know that's wild to think yeah about. well i just when, when you think about because later on in his career he wasn't racing a ton i think he's trying to manage his injuries so maybe that's another thing in retrospect uh, and and with the benefit of the sports science advancements now of just like how to manage his his races throughout his career, maybe it would have kept him uh, kept him fresher. I did see from David Monty's article that he estimated he had over forty MRIs throughout his career, oh, which wow. is I mean I don't know everybody's MRI count, but that seems pretty high. <laughs> I think he's leading the leading the charge on MRIs. <laughs> Yeah, Eric Sawinski is leading the league in uh, airline miles because he runs every single 800 in the world, and Ritz has uh, has a lead in MRIs. But great career, nonetheless, a legend retires. I think that's it. Do you have any other last words, Gordon? No, great. He's part of the December 30th club. Like I said, mm -hmm. me, Carson Wentz, Nick Simmons, and then LeBron James and Tiger Woods. It's a great. Uh, group of athletes and gordon so yeah I appreciate december 30th well, when you get a hold you of know, him, ask ask him about april 30th when you get a chance i will at your I next will. meeting i have an appointment with them i think a, a few few hours after this pod awesome all right that's it for today's episode flowtrack podcast at gmail.com we're on apple Podcasts, spotify stitcher and wherever else you get your podcasts and you can find all the old episodes on flowtrack.org slash flowtrackpodcast. Thanks to Alon for producing. We will talk to you guys tomorrow.